Today, I share a conversational duet with Christina Chong, who plays security chief on Nuni and Sing. We raise the curtain on everything that went into making this week's musical masterpiece, and we give a standing ovation to this season's incredible costumes. Silence your cell phones and pagers. Pagers? It's showtime in the ready room. Hey nerds, I'm Will Wheaton. This is The Ready Room, your official behind the scenes hub for all things Star Trek universe. In this week's episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds titled Subspace Rhapsody, the Enterprise crew repeatedly breaks out into song. But if that's not music to your ears quite yet, <clears throat> I'm calling for a red alert, cause spoilers, they just really hurt. And I don't want you mad at me, cause the ready room's not spoiler free. So if you haven't watched this week, then grab a seat and take a peek. Then when you've streamed the episode, come back here for what I've foretold. If you haven't seen this week's episode, take a seat in the mezzanine, stream it, and come back here for all the backstage info. I am so excited to be speaking with Christina Chong, aka La'an Nooney and Sing, live from her world tour. We are going to chat about La'an's emotional journey this season, the perils of time travel, and of course, singing on board the Enterprise. And one of the most important elements of any performance on stage or on screen is the costumes. The costume can literally make the difference between a character feeling real and not landing on the audience at all. And the costumes in Strange New Worlds are on a whole other level. Later, we will rate the fit, as the kids say, and get all the behind the scenes details on this season's incredible costumes. But before any of that, this week's episode truly goes where no Star Trek has gone before. Of course, there have been a few songs sung in Star Trek over the years. Like, who doesn't love a good Klingon opera? But there's never been a full-blown musical episode like this one. And that inspired us here in the ready room to choreograph a look at the making of this one-of-a-kind episode. Control room, five, six, seven, eight, engage. The engine's chamber and containment field are stable. The most confounding thing, I appear to be singing. Most unusual, so peculiar. When I first found out we were doing a musical episode, I was terrified. I sort of knew what I was getting myself into, and so it was a, a bit of a, an overwhelming experience to know that we were going to be having choreography rehearsals and going to a recording studio and really, really giving our all to it. We can't half-bake a musical. We can't half-bake anything in Star Trek. Our first day on the musical when Pike is singing on the bridge was my first day that there was song on, uh, on set. It was just like, whoa, like this is crazy. I can't believe we're singing on the bridge of the Enterprise right now. But again, it was still very grounded in Star Trek. Like it's still very, we're all approaching it with like scientific minds and inquiry and like, like oh, I'm singing, like what is happening? Um, so that was really cool. We were so excited when we found out we were doing a musical episode. I, I feel like it's something we've all been praying for and waiting for. It's literally my dream to do a musical. It's such a cool concept. It's not a musical episode. It is a episode about very real people being stuck in a musical experience. I do believe that this is going to be seen as one of the great Star Trek episodes. The idea why this reality is compelling us to confess our deepest emotions. I have a theory. I think since we're in a musical reality, we're actually following the rules of musicals. The thing that I love so much about musicals is that each song has to tell a story. And, and then all the songs have to work together to give the continuity of the piece. It seems like the hardest thing that could ever be done, and it wasn't. It was a joy. All the songs are wonderful. Throughout season one, kept saying, can we do a mu musical episode, it'd be great, musical episode. We Rebecca sings, Rebecca's got, Sally's a freaking Grammy Award winner. I was in musicals before I came into this job. And they're like, well, funny enough, it's kind of been, the idea's been thrown around. And I was like, oh, 
A lot of people are surprised to find this out, but I come from a musical theater background, so I love that I got to work with Dan and Celia and Jess. What's so brilliant is that everyone had their own distinct piece of music. Probably one of my favorite episodes of the entire season. We see Uhura sing and finally like really, really relish in the fact that she is someone who has an essential place and an, and an essential role in how the Enterprise functions. Pike in this episode calls her the voice of the Enterprise, and I find that so sweet because that really is what she is. She is the, the, the person who keeps the entire crew connected, and she has a way of just tapping into the humanity of each of the crew members and really using that as a way to weave us together in this beautiful family. She has this moment within her where she looks up to the heavens and she's like, I see you, I hear you, I'm here, you are reaching me. We get to do a lot of dancing. We worked with a, a fantastic uh, choreographer. We worked with a fantastic uh, voice coach. Everybody, all the creatives that they brought in that were involved, especially in the musical episode, had such fantastic vision and they were so supportive and so intelligent. I have an, a real appreciation for how much work goes into musicals and musical theater. You need people who can write the music, you need actors who can perform it, you need to give everybody seven times as much time to choreograph it and think it through. How are you gonna have people doing a dance number down the hallway of the Enterprise? You know, it's like, it's a whole thing. There is a great deal of enthusiasm and excitement, excitement coming from cast, all incredibly supportive and committed and devoted. And I think those are the parameters to make anybody dance. If if there, if there is that kind of openness, excitement, and enthusiasm, we can all dance and have a great deal of fun. Like this cast works really hard and, and they're in every day. And, th and then on top of their everyday work, I would look around and everybody had like <laughs> their lines for 209. And it was like their music and their lines and they were going over the choreography in their heads. And I was like, wow, the bar is high. I was a very excited to get the score. And then when I got the score, I was like, it's an entire album of music. This is a full on Broadway musical score. <laughs> I'm not prepared for this at all. So we need to do that again, but with more, a lot more. You mean like a ensemble number? Or... Not just an ensemble number, a grand finale. I love singing, I love movement. I love storytelling through song. I'm glad that this episode, episode 209, is one that is very aware of itself. We know we're singing, we know it's out of the ordinary, we know that something is definitely not the way it should be. And the fact that we have that and yet we still get to have fun, you see it on our faces in, in the episode. We're all having such a great time. I enjoyed filming it. I enjoyed filming it, probably more than I would admit. Well, I loved this episode and I am so excited to talk about it with Christina Chong, who is joining us from the other side of the planet. Hello, Christina. Hello, hello from Greece. <laughs> Greece looks absolutely beautiful. I appreciate you taking some time out of your Grecian holiday to spend a bit of time with us here in the Ready Room today. Thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, this is a historic episode. It is the first musical episode in Star Trek history. I can't believe I can actually ask an actor this question. Did you ever think you would be performing a musical in space? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but it was my absolute dream to do a musical, either a musical film or a musical TV episode. Um, and I actually, from from season one, throughout season one, I um, I would ask or rather pitch my version of a musical to any writer who would listen. I grabbed Davey, I've grabbed Bill, I'd grabbed Akiva, I grabbed Henry. I was like, guys, so here we go. Star Trek, maybe there's like a Gorn tap dance thing. Like, and I, I had all these ideas of like sparkly costumes, all of this. I said, be great, be great, never done, never done. And they were like, hmm, interesting you say that we've had thoughts about doing a musical before and I was like oh really so then I knew I was onto something so then I just kept pushing it and pushing it and so season one we had a little break before doing some pickup shots so I think it was the month of August we were off and then we came back for September and all the writers came to set and we had this dinner which Akiva um, hosted and Akiva's like 
sit next to him. I sat next to him and he was like, guess what, kid? I was like, what? We're doing the musical. I was like, oh, and you can't, I mean, that moment for me, I was like tears. I mean, not literally, but like on the inside tears. Um, and I was just like, you, I, I was like, Akiva, you know, have no idea what that means to me. It's literally been my dream. It's, I started in musical theater. I got, I came out of musical theater to go into TV and film. And the idea was that I would raise my profile so that, that I could go back into musicals and play leads. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't want to, you know, be ensemble. So if I do it that way, maybe, maybe it's a, a clever idea. Suddenly my whole career came 360 I was like wow it all made sense the hard years of dance training and singing and all of that suddenly accumulated into this one episode I was like mind blown absolute mind blown my notes while I was watching this episode are just variations of oh my god x is so incredibly talented oh my god I can't believe they can dance like that so um uh, I'm actually really glad to to hear that I I have the sense just from, you know, theater kids can see theater kids, right? And I have yeah. this I have this sense that your cast is very much theater kids. So I imagine <laughs> yeah. that in that moment, Akiva kind of put a big, beautiful present on, on a shelf for you and wrapped it up and said, you don't get to open this for how long did you have to wait? For like at least eight months I think it was seven or eight months that's so, such a long you know, time to wait <laughs> I know and in the meantime I'm thinking oh my god Runa tap shoes I don't yeah. know like you know all the my mind's going crazy um but then obviously you know when it came down to it they were like this is the first time we're doing this we want it to be really grounded we want it to make sense we want it to feel real so I think it's brilliant the choice and the direction they went with it is perfect the fun that you are all having uh, really shines through. Uh, we have seen so many uh, 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 shots of you and Celia singing together uh, uh, backstage and, and outside of, of scenes. <laughs> On the set of Next Generation, our big musical guys were Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner. Yep. Like they just, they sang constantly all of the time. Um, are the two of you the big musical nerds on your set? So, yes, I, I would say Celia more than me. She's got a Grammy. She's incredible. <laughs> I let Celia take the floor whenever Celia's there. She's got an incredible voice. So unusual, most peculiar of her. You know, one of the things that, that we, we really love about musicals is that every character in a musical really feels big feelings. And Laang really goes through quite a wide range of emotions in this episode, musically and through dialogue. Would you talk about that a little bit? She really, really experiences quite a lot this week. After episode three, where she's kind of found here, found this amazing connection, lost it. I guess it's that reigniting a flame. You know each other? Um. Yeah, yes, but I, I, I still need to do a security clearance. Lead the way. Oh, sorry. The fear of, of almost losing him twice as well. The thought of going and, and putting herself out there and the, the emotional energy that takes to say, hey, listen, I like you, which she eventually does. I'm in a relationship. A sometimes relationship and right now is one of those times in a very real way to then be hit with i do like you too but i'm i'm engaged elsewhere like carol baby yeah. um is like rejection twice um so for laan that's huge because she's just not the person who who finds it easy to connect and open up and be vulnerable with but I think it's also because I think what really connected them in episode three is the fact that he wasn't aware of who she is and you know she's a descendant of Khan he's not even aware there's no judgment so I think so that's kind of what allowed her to really open up and obviously the adventures they went on and the thrill of it all so there's that and then there's the empowering that Una gives her the empowerment to be like, yes, you know, you can kind of, you can do this. Rebecca reminds me a lot of Jerry Ryan in that she has real big loving mom protector energy. 
Um, yes. And, and I feel like she brings that to Una. There's a moment toward the beginning of this episode when Kirk's beaming onto the Enterprise and Laon's like, oh, I'm just going to go there and meet him. It's totally normal. It's not because I like him. Shut up. And uh, in the audience, I'm like, oh, Una knows. <laughs> Laon is so oh. busted. Yeah, and Rebecca's look every time got me. I wanted to laugh on the inside because I was like, <laughs> I can't laugh. But like, sh that look was just gold. She's so talented. The two of you have that remarkable duet together. It's such a gorgeous song and it's such a beautiful number. And I was, uh, I was watching you do wire work in, in, in this scene. Now I've only done wire work once and I found that uh, uh, there is a place on the harness where every ounce of my body weight uh, goes. Doesn't matter where it is, right? So like maybe, maybe my right hip is gonna yeah. hold all 160 pounds of me. I feel like it is challenging to keep the song going and keep the choreography going and stay connected to the other actor in the scene. And being on a harness and flying around seems like something extra challenging that is a, a real difficulty multiplier for that. Uh, what was that experience like for you guys when you were in that set? I mean, luckily we both had previous wire work experience, so we knew what was coming. So that helped hugely. Yeah. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it's still very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> it's not anywhere you want to be longer than is necessary. So luckily, we weren't up there forever. Something that was very unexpected for me was uh, Chekhov's Klingon dance number that was placed on the mantle <laughs> in like act two. And I'm just waiting for it to go off. Just, I just oh. cannot stop. I'm staring at that, waiting for it to go off. It finally goes off. It is, it's such a huge payoff. It's exactly what we want. Why are you only calling us when you got your dramas? One of these days when we'll pay you, we'll pay you. I did not know until I was prepping to talk to you that it's Bruce Horak doing K-pop Klingon moves. Oh my God, that also was one of my favorite parts of the thing as well. And those dancers, the whole thing, me and Celia, every time we were doing that number, we're trying to learn the choreography, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. Um, and I was so happy that Bruce was back. We all love him. We talked a little bit about, about La'an uh, being willing to be vulnerable. Uh, as a consequence of what experiencing her uh, alternate timeline with Jim Kirk uh, took her through and, and then sort of seeing him a couple of other times since then. We've talked about that a little bit, but I wondered if you just wanted to drill down into it for a second. La'on has had to live her entire life with that uh, prejudice against her because of her, her ancestry that she can't help. You don't grow up with a bioengineered mass murderer your ancestor and not develop a thick skin. I really understand this, uh, this need to be protective of yourself and this need to be defensive when everyone you meet just expects certain things from you before you even get a chance to show them who you are. And I, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, I, I just personally, as someone who struggles with that myself, I have, uh, I've drawn a lot of uh, uh, comfort watching La'an experience that herself. Do you wanna talk about that at all? Yeah, so um, I think that moment when she sees the young Khan is just a child, you know? Yeah. No one grows up evil. No one is born evil. You know, it's it's through a process of experiences, childhood trauma and whatever else he's been through. And I think that moment for her was like, oh, oh. And I felt the weight of the whole star trek legacy and the fandom and everything on me on that moment when i was looking into these little boy's eyes he was such oh. a beautiful little boy and i was like wow i could feel everyone looking at this little boy going oh that's khan yeah. and i think that really touched her on and she was like okay it's people don't necessarily see why people are how they are I think it's it's everything together comes to that moment when Laan is ready to fully accept who she is and yes, be proud of it. Yes, I am a descendant of Khan and what? That's who I am. I'm gonna accept it now and fully love herself ultimately. Maybe I could be someone who takes chances more often. So we will see that hopefully, you know, moving into the next seasons as well. This is a, an evolving La'an. And it was quite tricky for me to pitch 
her in season two because she's slowly, steadily revealing layers of the, take it, peeling layers of the onion off to get to the raw core of who she is, um, that childlike Laan. But obviously she's still Laan, she, it's a process. When I was getting ready to talk to you for season one, I re-watched the original series episode Space Seed, and I remember making a joke to my wife at the end of the episode that Kirk is like, well, I mean, listen, he's a eugenicist and killed like untold numbers of people, but listen, I'm gonna drop him off on SETI Alpha 5 and it's gonna be totally fine. This is absolutely not gonna come back and be a problem for us in the 80s. <laughs> and as I was watching this episode, I thought, wait a minute, could it possibly be that Kirk's connection to La'an affects his decision to give her ancestor that opportunity at some kind of redemption in exile. Um, does this seem like a weird Star Trek theory to you? I'm on board because I would love to go even more into that and to see even more in the future how how the La'an, Nunian Singh, Khan, Nunian Singh, connections affect history or not. There's a thing that Strange New Worlds has been doing consistently for me where it, uh, uh, you all do something that is wonderful on its own, it's great storytelling, but it manages to give extra weight and extra gravitas and extra importance to characters from other Star Trek shows that are kind of, that aren't, aren't really on the, uh, in front of the camera all the time. And I'm thinking of Carol and their, their, yeah. their son, like, like being a thing, like we all in the audience know, um, it, it makes me look at La'an in a very different way. Like, oh man, this really is going to suck for you. <laughs> like, this is, this is, <laughs> this is not going to go, this is not going the way that you want it to. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That was because obviously I was learning about all of that as we were shooting. You know, I was like, "Who's Carol? Yeah. Like, who's Carol?" So <laughs> then I've got to go and do my research and yeah. look who Carol. Look at Carol. Um, but we don't know because we've still got years. Yeah. Before we get there, we have one episode left. Uh, mm -hmm. And I am just wondering uh, uh, if you wanted to uh, maybe uh, prep. The audience, are we going to want a security blanket, a box of tissues? Are we going to be laughing ourselves uh, into oblivion? What can we expect next week? You are definitely going to want all of those things. Tissues, okay. tissues, security blanket. There's going to be a few laughs here and there. Yeah. But as there always is, because you've got to have comedy in, in, in drama. Um, but it's going to come to a head. Okay. Almost, but not quite. Very mysterious. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Christina, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your performance uh, as La'an and, and just for all of your, the, the, for the gift of your song this week. It was really lovely to experience that. Oh, thank you, Will. In this week's episode, number one sings a line about her love of Gilbert and Sullivan music. From what Gilbert and Sullivan operetta did she previously sing a song? A, HMS Pinafore, B, The Mikado, C, The Pirates of Penzance, or D, The Yeoman of the Guard? Don't boldly go anywhere, stay tuned for the answer. This season of Star Trek Strange New World sees the Enterprise pursue the promise of the premise as its crew encounters a lot of new life and new civilizations. Boldly, as it turns out. Each one of them has a wonderfully unique fashion sense, and they've all sprung from the mind of costume designer Bernadette Croft and her incredible team. Here's a behind-the-scenes look at this season's stunning costumes. Episode one, we're introduced to a planet called Kajatar. So we have Spock, we have Ahura, we have Mbenga, we have Chapel, and they're all in disguises. Well, it looks like our cover's blown. <laughs> This is Chapel's costume, and here's Anna, she's our key textile artist. So Chapel's costume, we had to produce five multiples of. This mesh shirt was a design by our digital costumer, Jen Bowen. We used screen printing. Here we also screen printed, but this time foiling adhesive, and then foiled to give it a shine that Bernadette wanted when she was in action and moving around. All the pieces are integrated to reflect like the wear and the grime of her environment. And then here we have Mbenga. This coat had a big split in the back and we wanted it to kind of like really move for the stunt sequences. 
So this leather, we pre-washed 15 cow hides. Uh, we did this to soften the leather and give it some texture before building the garment. And these are actually stretch panels down the inside of his arms and around the shoulders. We also went in by hand foiling elements of the design back to, again, how Bernadette wanted things to kind of shine and sparkle as they move in action. We're actually introduced to Klingons for the first time in Strange New Worlds. We see the rebel Klingons, which are very rough around the edges. They're warrior-esque. They've got a lot of leather and metal components to their costumes. They're very broken down. Beat that, human. We really wanted to have a lot of texture in the costumes. I use puff paint. It rises and creates a 3D effect when heated at high temperatures. Here we actually applied it by hand and heated it to give a risen kind of 3D grime effect. We just want to make it look as gritty and like foul as possible. So we've added like really textured leather pieces, this spinal detail with this metal. We wanted him to look really rough, uh, really intimidating, imposing. So we really wanted to make this character look as cool as possible. And then we also see the military type, so the gold and the black Klingon costumes. First of all, this entire costume is made from leather. Back in the day, in the 60s, the belt buckle was bubble wrap. <laughs> so like 50 years later, we're 3D printing these key pieces, so it's really amazing how far we've come. One Easter egg that Bernadette felt she had to include in our Klingons was the addition of Ow. the Klingon Talon. Uh, you may remember it from an episode in TNG. They actually hid a weapon in their toe. It was a very fun piece to add. We have these skeletal pieces that were hand sculpted. With the textured leather, we paint with metallic paint, and that gives an overall gold color. And then to give an extra dimension, we will foil on top of it the paint. What's great about the foil is that it really catches the light on camera. We want it to look sharp and dangerous looking, like it could cut you. The art of textiles, we can kind of like have these little tricks up our sleeves to kind of emulate armor that's been worn in battle, for instance. The engagement ceremony in 205 was such a great episode for costumes. We're introduced to Tipring's parents. Tipril, who's Tipring's mother, she's a little much, she's a little bit of drama. So she was wearing this beautiful sculpted gown, reminiscent of Japanese culture. She was wearing this beautiful belt with this obi style origami decorative piece at the back. Uh, we wanted something very queen-like, very majestic, and fabric that really had a lot of texture. When Bernadette designed this, she had in mind to frame the character's face and not just frame in an angular, sharp way, but it's got curves, so it kind of hovers around her like a halo. I think there's probably about upwards of 250 pieces that were pieced together. But yeah, this sunburst pattern is so beautiful and the way it framed her face and the reflection of this metallic fabric was really special. When we were looking at the costumes for episode seven, the Lower Decks episode, it was really fun to look at the costumes and think, how are we going to bring these animation to our world? We backed the costumes with scuba, so it kind of like floated off the body and made everything look really smooth. Again, we really wanted to perfect our interpretation of the animated characters. So we custom hand dyed these little pieces of fabric. This is all custom painted, really tried to get the exact color of the show. Because we couldn't find this exact boot out in the world, it didn't exist. So we had to make it ourselves. We had to really look at every single detail. So even the bottoms of the shoes in Lower Decks, there's a little delta and a little a stripe. So we actually, we did that as well. It was a fun moment to look at all those like special details of the animation. So. We just wanted them to look like they've stepped out into real time. Working with Jack Quaid and Tawny Newson was amazing. It was a really fun episode for us to dress our cast. Whoa. In this week's episode, number one sings a line about her love of Gilbert and Sullivan music. From what Gilbert and Sullivan operetta did she previously sing a song? A, HMS Pinafore, B, the Mikado, C, the Pirates of Penzance, or D, the Yeoman of the Guard? And the answer is C, the Pirates of Penzance. In the Short Treks episode Q&A, Una and Spock are stuck in a turbo lift for several hours. 
While giving some advice to Spock, Una reveals her vocal prowess with a rendition of I am the very model of a modern major general. Can you believe there's only one episode left in this season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds? I know, I know! But like Captain Patel, I also have a priority one mission, sharing an exclusive clip from next week's season finale episode with you. No assumptions here. Spot. Scan for life signs and escape pods. We don't know what happened to that crew. My scans are not functioning. Communications, too. Transporter is down as well. What's going on? I detected counter frequency emanating from the planet. It appears to be negating all scans, communications, and transporter signals between here and there. Any idea what's causing it? I believe the Gorn might have an interference field. A weapon to deploy during invasions renders their enemies blind, unable to communicate or move. So there's no way to beam anyone off that ship or the planet? That is correct, Captain. And we need to think harder. When I last spoke with Captain Patel, she was on the surface, which means she's probably still there, along with a lot of her crew as well. Remember your training. Starfleet protocols would have any survivors of Cayuga trying to figure out a way to reach anyone who can listen. Comms are down, but we still have line of sight. She's right. Survivors could use that to send us signals. Fires, lights, smoke. Start observations. If there's anyone alive down there, I want to know it. Incoming warp signature detected in orbit of Parnassus Beta. Red alert. Do we have visuals? Yes, Captain. I believe it is a Gorn Hunter ship. Lon, prepare phasers, but hold your fire. Phasers locked and holding, sir. Captain, I'm receiving a secure communications from outside of the interference field. It's from Starfleet. What does it say? They've received a message from the Gorn, sir. A message? Saying what? It's an image. Put it on screen. Stand by. It looks like a demarcation line. It's the Parnassus Beta and all their forces on the far side of the line. Starfleet has ordered us to maintain our side of the line. Command crew, ready room now. I'm going to go way out on a limb here and predict yet another epic Star Trek series season finale. I had such a good time talking to Christina Chong today, and I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Isn't Star Trek the best? Next week, we take a deep dive into Strange New World season two finale titled Hegemony. There will be a lot to talk about, including a special look at how Legacy FX Studios created some of the amazing practical effects this season. You don't want to miss that. Until then, I'm Will Wheaton. Live long and prosper.